George sat in the thick silence of his room. A few minutes ago, he had scrolled the dial across the radio, hoping to hear his favorite song. Even earlier, he surfed his satellite TV, looking for a show about cars that he watched every week. But now, in the silence, he wondered, where's the music, the laughter, the images, the words that filled the air when the radio and TV were on? They're still there, he realized, in the room, just as real as when he could hear and see them. But without the TV and the radio to tune them in, George's eyes, ears, and mind were unable to pick them up at all. The radio waves were as real as the smell of coffee coming from his kitchen. They existed all around him, but in a realm beyond him. All this made George wonder, what's really out there, as opposed to what he can sense? What does exist beyond our limited senses? What other things are out there, maybe even all around us, that we can't see or hear or feel or taste or touch? I'm here to tell you and George that we can indeed be shown what's behind the view of the world that's funneled to us through the shallow channels of our senses. And I believe you will be thrilled to know that what's out there offers us crisp and sure reasons to hope. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. Presented by Mark Finley. The Flip Side of Love. For thousands of years, people have wondered at some of the things that George wondered about. What's the real nature of the world? What's it made of? What makes it tick? Why does something do this instead of that? What's behind the appearance of things? The ancient Greeks were the first people to ask those questions in a scientific manner. And though their answers aren't always very satisfying, at least they had the gumption to ask them. Thales, who lived about five centuries before Christ, believed that everything in nature was made of water. Anaximander thought everything was made out of air. Heraclitus believed that the universe and all that moved in it came from fire. Democritus believed all things, great and small, hard and soft, changing and immutable, were created from particles too small to see. He named them atoms. Scientists today are still asking the very same questions that those ancient Greeks did, still looking for some precise formula that explains the nature of the world, both seen and unseen. And yet I don't believe they're going to find it by splitting the atom any further or by peering deeper into the sky with the Hubble Space Telescope or by conjuring up some mathematical formula on a blackboard. Now that's not because a basic explanation of the world doesn't exist. On the contrary, I believe that one does. But it's not written in numbers. It's not written in mathematical equations or formulas. It's written in blood the blood of Christ, and what it says to us is this. It's found in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16. Three simple, short, powerful words. God is love. God is love. Three plain, one-syllable words. Say them out loud with me. God is love. Simple words to be sure. Yet what they mean is so profound, I wouldn't sit here before you pretending that I could plumb their depths. If the text said merely God shows love or God exudes love, that would be easier to understand. But God is love? And though I don't grasp all of what those words mean, I can grasp some. And what they tell me is that the God I worship is a loving God. They tell me that he's a caring God. They tell me that what he does, he does out of love. They tell me that love is the driving force behind our universe. 
Now, this idea that God is love also comes with some very important concepts for us. And today, I'd like to share just one of them with you. In the Gospel of Matthew, a lawyer comes to Jesus and asks him what was the greatest commandment in the law. For these religious Jews, the law was the foundation of their religious life. And for someone to ask Jesus which was the greatest commandment in the law was a serious question indeed. And how did the Lord respond? We find it recorded in Matthew chapter 22 and verses 37 and 38. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. We've already seen that God is love, and whatever that means, it at least means that love is an overriding characteristic of God. But notice that not only does God love, but he is commanding that we love as well. And here's the amazing thing. The first and greatest commandment is the one commandment that God cannot force us to obey. I'd like you to think carefully about this with me. God could force you not to commit adultery if he chose. God could force you not to steal if he chose. God could force you not to lie. See, he could program our brains so we didn't do any of those things. But he could not force us to love him because love to be loved must be free. The moment love is forced, it is no longer love. Can you understand this? Love by its very nature is love, is something that has to be freely given or it can't be given at all. Forced love is a contradiction, a sheer logical impossibility. Can a circle have four square corners? Of course not, because the moment it has four square corners, it's no longer a circle. Can a triangle be round? Of course not, because the moment it's round, it's no longer a triangle. And finally, can love be coerced or forced? Of course not, because the moment that it's forced, the moment that it's coerced, it's no longer love. So even God cannot force anyone to love him. He can create a night sky full of stars. He can put the spout on the whale. He can crush a mighty army in an instant. He can do all those things and an infinite number more. But one thing he cannot do is force you, sitting where you are right now, to love him. If you love God, you must do so freely or not at all. Think about it, friends. God can force every intelligent being in the universe to fear him. He can force every being to obey him. He can force every being to worship him but he can't force even one to love him. Why? Because the moment that love is forced, it's something other than love. A man was studying the Bible with his young daughter. One day he told his little girl that he longed to see her choose to serve and to love the Lord. She looked at him with her big blue eyes and asked, Daddy, would you make me love God if you could? He stopped and stared at his precious child and thought, would he make her love God if he could? After a few pensive moments, he gently lifted her head and said, no, honey, I wouldn't force you to love God because I can't. I don't even want to try because then it would not be love. This man, a theologian, understood at that moment as never before why love to God had to be freely given. There is just no other way. This point is crucial to understanding so much about our world. Even the Lord God himself cannot force you to love him. Now, if God is love, if love permeates the universe, and if the first and great commandment is to love God, then freedom, moral freedom, must be a basic part of creation. And what this means is that we can't love God unless we are free to not love him. To truly love God, we have to have the option, the freedom, to not love God. Now, this is a paradox for sure. Yet, if the only choice we have is to love God, if there's no other option, then we really couldn't love him because when love is not freely given, it's not really love. Let's bring it down to another level. One aspect of a love relationship between two people is the knowledge that this person is with you because they choose to be with you. They spend time with you, do things with you, not only because they choose to, but because they want to be with you. 
But that relationship would lose something, something big, something crucial, would it not? If you knew that the person was with you only because he or she were forced to be there, of course it would, because whatever kept the person with you, it wasn't love. A servant cooks his master's meal because if he doesn't, he'll be dismissed. A wife cooks her husband's meal because she loves him. Now it's true either way, the man gets his supper. But the former action is not the kind of obedience God wants. He wants us to worship and obey him out of love, not fear and coercion. Bank robbers in jail no longer rob banks. Embezzlers behind bars no longer embezzle company funds. Car thieves in the clink no longer steal cars. They're not committing these felonies, and you and I aren't either. Yet there's a world of difference between why they don't commit a crime and why we don't. This point is so crucial because only as we understand the freedom inherent in love can we understand the existence of evil in a universe created by a loving God. This freedom explains how long ago one of God's creatures named Lucifer could fall into sin. Ezekiel writes about him in chapter 28, verses 14 and 15. And Ezekiel the prophet takes us behind the scenes and he says this, You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Here is this perfect being living in a perfect environment, heaven, and yet iniquity was found in him. How could a perfect being ever become iniquitous? Because that being was created free and freedom, to truly be freedom, must contain the potential to do wrong. It doesn't mean Lucifer had to disobey, heaven forbid. It means only that he had the freedom to do so if he chose to. Otherwise, this freedom would be an illusion. This same principle explains how our first parents, created perfect and living in a garden paradise, could fall into sin. Sure, God could have created them so that they could never sin, but then they could never have been free human beings either. And if not free, they could never have loved him. Love also explains how 2,000 years ago, when Jesus came in the flesh, he could be scorned, rejected, and hated. And that's because the same freedom that allows us to love God allows us to hate him. A middle-aged wife weeps bitterly. Her husband of many years walked out of the marriage, casting her aside for a young secretary at his office. She asks, how could this happen? A parent whose child chooses a life of thievery and violence and drugs asks, how could this happen? A man who loses a son in a terrorist attack asks, how could this happen? A man whose sister is sexually assaulted asks, how could this happen? The bottom line answer to these questions, the answer that's behind the veneer of what we can see and hear and feel and taste and touch is this, God is love. Love is the ultimate force in all creation, and love demands moral freedom. And it's true, our world has abused, terribly abused, that freedom. Now we read earlier that God is love. And whatever this means, it means at the very least that God loves us. In fact, God loves us so much that he doesn't want any of us to face the final horrible results of our abuse of the freedom he's given us. And that final horrible result is the eternal death that comes from sin. Indeed, sin is nothing but our abuse of freedom. And this talk about sin leads us to what I call the flip side of love. What do I mean? We've seen that love, to be love, must be free or else it can't be love. We saw, too, that even God himself can't force love. There are limits, then, to love. But there's another aspect of love, one which pushes those who love beyond the limits, almost to the point where there are no limits. And what I mean is that love has motivated people 
often greedy and selfish otherwise, to do things that no other force in the universe, fear, anger, jealousy, lust, pride, could ever get them to do. What prompted mothers during the Holocaust to throw their bodies in front of their children in order to protect them from bullets? What motivated a soldier in World War II to throw himself on a hand grenade in order to save lives in his platoon? What motivated Mother Teresa to live in the slums of India in order to minister to the poor and needy? What caused a young, healthy woman to give her kidney to a dying family member? What motivated a mother to risk death rather than to abort a child in a dangerous pregnancy? The answer to these and many other examples like them is the same. It's love. And so my final question for today is, if sinful, erring humans are capable of showing such selflessness and devotion, all due to love, what about the perfect God, who is in his very essence love? What would this love lead him to do? To die on the cross, that's what. It led him to pay in himself the penalty for our abuse of the freedom that's inherent in love. God didn't create beings in order to lock them in a moral prison where they were forced to do his bidding. That's why he made us free. And rather than take freedom from us, he took upon himself the final consequences and punishment of our disobedience, a disobedience that could have never arisen were we not free to begin with. Let's look at this famous text found in John chapter 3 and verse 16. Many of you, I'm sure, know it well. If you do, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Notice it was love, God's love that brought Jesus to the cross. It was love. God's love for us that caused him to die for our sins. And it was love, this same love that was revealed at the cross that gives us the hope of everlasting life. If God didn't love us, he wouldn't have died for us. It's just that simple. You are right now, as I speak, experiencing the moral freedom inherent in this love, the love that brought our Lord to Calvary. Right now, you have a choice a choice similar to what Lucifer had in heaven, to what our first parents had in paradise, and to what the leaders in Israel had during the time of Christ. And though it might seem that you have all sorts of choices, all sorts of options, all sorts of middle ground to dawdle in, that's only how it appears, and appearances can be deceiving. But today we went behind the scenes, behind what appears on the surface alone, and took a peek at ultimate reality, And in ultimate reality, there are just two choices, either to love God or not to love God. There's really nothing else. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you. And for me, see on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come on. For me, 
Why do we linger and heed not his mercy, mercy for you and for me? Now fleeting, the moments are passing, passing from you and from me. Shadows are gathering and the deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. And pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Now, I can't reach my hand out of your TV screen, grab you around the neck, and make you choose the right thing. Even if I could, I wouldn't, of course. I can't jump out of the TV into your house and force you to do the right thing. I wouldn't do that either. All I can do instead is point you to the cross, to the God who loves you too much to force you to obey. All I can do is show you Jesus dying for your wrong choices so that at the end of the age, you don't have to face the ultimate penalty for those choices. All I can do is point you to a love that goes beyond the limit, to a love that offers hope, promise, and a reason to live. Yes, God can hurl galaxies across the cosmos. Yes, God can raise dry and dusty bones to life. Yes, God can paint the whole sky a screaming blue. But what God cannot do is force you and me to love Him. Only we can make that choice, and we must make it ourselves. I'd like to invite you right now to yield your life to this God of incredible love. I'd like to invite you to make a choice, to use your moral freedom to serve Him. Only you can do that. Will you do it right now as we pray? Father in heaven, free choice is such a precious gift that rather than take it from us, you suffered the penalty for our abuse of that freedom. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds to the love revealed at Calvary. And then may we, stirred by the revelation of your gracious and forgiving character, give ourselves to you in faith, in obedience, and in love. 
In Jesus' name, amen. The essence of what it means to be human is to make moral choices. The freedom to choose defines me as a human being, and the God of heaven won't force me to choose him, but he will reveal his love in a million trillion ways. I thank God for that love and choose to serve him forever, and I know you do too. Until next week, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.